Hello and welcome to this video. So what we're going to do in this video then is actually incorporate the spread into the simulation. Now when you first start trading, spread can be a little bit confusing and I see so many backtest systems, even professional backtest systems that don't even take the spread into account when they're testing a strategy and this is obviously a very bad thing to do because as you'll see in this video, the spread has a real dramatic effect on the result, particularly as you go down to tighter time frames. So if you look at these three lines here, and I apologize if I'm explaining something that's absolutely clear, imagine we have a mid price of 100.00 for something. If you put a trade on a buy at this, you would actually buy at what's known as the ask price. Now the ask price, and we'll do this just for argument's say, might be 100.20. And you might say, well, so what? Well, at the same time, the bid price might be 99.80. Now, when you first go in the trade, you'll have bought at 100.20, but you're going to come back out at the bid price of 99.8. So if you made the trade and then closed it straight away, you would lose 0.4. In other words, you start the trade at the difference between the ask and the bid in negative, let's say. And the same goes the other way around for a sell. So when you sell, you put the trade on at the bid price and close it at the asking price. Now all of our simulations until now have used just the mid price. And as you know, we've used the mid price to define this blue dot, which is our trigger point, our entry point, and then our stop loss and our take profit. So to incorporate the spread in our simulation, we're going to have to change things a little bit. So I've tried to represent this with this horrible diagram here, but let's imagine we get a trigger for a buy. Now at the moment we're placing the buy just above the high of the mid price. But now what we're going to do is place it just above and calculate it from the high of the ask price. And then we're going to set our stop loss and take profit accordingly. What we'll then do is use the M5 candles on the bid price, which is this, low, which is this lower line here, to track the price going all the way using the stop loss and take profit that we set for the asking price. That way we're including the spread in the results. And as I've already said, you're going to see it's going to have quite a negative impact on the results. The opposite would then apply here, obviously, for a sell. So the question is, how do we go about doing that inside our code? Now, I'm going to work inside the inside bar explore and the inside bar timings that we have been. You might want to make a backup of these two so that you've got the original code just with the mid, because I know some people like just to do their simulations without using the spread at all. And we're going to be changing quite a bit of code, so it might be an idea just to back those up. But I'm going to carry on regardless in these files and hope that I don't make uh, too much of a mess of this. So inside the inside bar explore, down where we're setting up the data frame here, we're going to need to add on the high of the asking price of the previous candle. That's for the case where we have the buy and the bid of the low of the previous candle, because that's in the case of a sell. And then we have to make one change here where we get our entry stop. So here we're saying for a buy that we're putting the range times the entry percentage, that stays the same, obviously the 10%, and adding that onto the mid-high previous. Well, as I've just explained in the slide, we're now going to change that and we're actually going to add on the ask high previous because we're going in at the asking price. And then we've got the opposite for the sell where we're going in at the bid price. So we're going to make this here then the bid low previous. Now one issue here is we don't have the ask high and the bid low inside the data frame because we're taking just these columns here. So what I'm going to actually do now is take out all of this column selection here and we'll just keep all of the columns because it doesn't really matter. So with that changed here and everything done, I just want to go up to the top of the file and I'm going to re-execute everything so that we make sure we've got a clean set of data and we've saved the file. And now we can switch over into working in the inside bar timings where it's going to be a little bit more complicated. So the first thing I'm going to do in this one is load up the DF trades again straight away. So we have everything. Make sure I've re-executed all the way down through here. And now we're going to be making a few changes with the functions that we've written before. The good news is, is signal text triggered and end hit calc can all stay exactly the same. The big changes are going to come here. So the process trade is actually going to disappear. So we don't need that anymore. We're going to do things with a slightly different bit of logic. So first of all, then inside the process buy, I'm going to switch things around a bit just to make them also easier for me. So we're going to change the arguments inside here to be take profit, stop loss, the ask prices, the bid prices and the entry price. So just going back to the slide here, remember we're looking for the ask price that hits our blue dot. And once we've done that, we're then going to, wherever we are, whatever index we are in the list here, we're then going to follow the bid prices and see how they perform against our take profit and stop loss. So we can remember that we've used some code before down the bottom here with this enumerate to be able to get the index out of here because we're going to need the index. 
At the top of the process by then we can say for index and price in enumerate ask prices, so loop through the ask prices. We can then ask the question, if we've triggered in a buy direction with the current price above our empty price, then we know that we're into our trade. And now what we want to do here is we want to loop through the bid prices from the current index where we are. So again, back into the slide, we've hit here this ask at the blue dot at a certain index. We're now going to take that index in the list and just jump to the bid prices and carry on following those. So here we'll have a loop that says for live price in bid prices index to the end. And now we can tab this along and make sure that we have live price here and we get exactly the same kind of result. The other thing we need to do now is tab this return along a little bit here so that if we have triggered then we need to calculate what we've managed to do at the end. And instead of the price again we use the live price that we hit if we get to the end of the list. And here we use the entry price because things have changed. We keep the other two arguments the same. And otherwise, what we've not managed to do at all is trigger the trade so we can return zero. So now I'm going to do something very dangerous. I'm going to copy this process by code and paste it into the process cell and watch things go completely out of control. I'm also going to copy the arguments of the uh, process by and paste them into the arguments of the process cell. And now here be careful. So we want to loop through the bid prices and then we want to loop through the ask prices here. And then we want to say if the live price is less than or equal to the take profit, we're good. Or if it's greater than or equal to the stop loss, we're good. In the triggered here, we need a minus one because we have a cell and also down here. And by the way, in general, in reality, you would have somewhere in your code some constants for cell set to a minus one and also for the gain and loss so that we didn't keep typing these numbers like this again and again. This is not very good practice for this course. It'll do. So I don't want to spend too much time messing around with that. But really, in your scripts, you would look to write yourselves constants with these numbers inside. It's pretty poor to hard code these numbers in here like this, but it'll do for now. So just to check this then, processing a sell, we go through the bid prices, which is, which is correct because we're the opposite way around to a buy. And then we trigger ourselves on a minus one and the current price. And then we have our live prices now on the ask, which is correct because it's the higher of the two prices. We're in a sell. And then we look to see if we're less than the take profit, greater than stop loss. Otherwise, we have a sell, uh, which we evaluate for our fraction and otherwise we return zero zero. So we can actually get rid of this process M5. We don't need that anymore and execute and hope I haven't made too many spelling mistakes above here. And now down in the following cell we run the trade. I think from the previous video's code I've just removed a print line and maybe an if statement with a break or something just to slim it out. We have our total. We're looping through our trades as before. We're selecting our M5 data as before. But now we have to make a little bit of a change in the logic here because we no longer have the uh, process M5 code here. So first of all, we're going to say if row.signal is equal to 1. Just make a little bit of room so we can see the process by here. We're going to say that R is equal to process by and then row.take profit, row.stop loss, M5 data, ask C values, M5 data, bid C values and row.entry. And then we can type the total is plus equal R. Otherwise, we can make a copy and paste of this code here, which always sends the fear into me and type process cell. Otherwise, I think everything else is absolutely identical. And again, increase R. So I'm going to take a deep breath and actually run this and see what we get out the bottom. And actually, the result is actually around half of what it was when we hadn't included the spread. Now, if you're new to this or you don't do back testing with spread included a lot, you might be surprised at just how bad the impact is on the result of using the spread. And that's the reason I wanted to do it. The moving average example we had, I can't remember, I think we had 500 trades a year and I think one of them was gaining, let's say, a thousand pips. Well, if you think that the average spread per trade is three pips, then that is already no longer gaining a thousand pips. It's losing because three times the 500 is 1,500 pips lost only to spread. And in fact, you often see quoted the average spread, so two, three pips, something like this. But what you don't see is the variability of the spread throughout the day. And at certain times of day, the spread can actually be very, very big. And at certain times of day, it can be very, very small. And the brokers know what they're doing and they open the spread when we're likely to be in circumstances where a particular event is going on and lots of trading is going to happen. So we've actually come quite far now with the... <clears throat> 
So we've actually now done two kinds of simulation. One was quite a simple one with the moving average cross, and then one was quite a more involved and complicated one with spread using this inside bar. And we've been able to take a certain granularity for our strategy for our and break it down into the five minute candles to try and get some better idea of how good the uh, strategy is with a, a relative, uh, relatively good accuracy using the five minute candles. Now you may have noticed that we didn't use a class in this simulation, we did in the four hour one in the code here which we then turned into a nice data frame here which we used to look at our trades in the plot and stuff like this. Of course there's no reason why you can't do something like that in this one, I haven't because I don't really want to use the information. One of the bits of information I'm curious about though is how the gains look to achieve this 43, as it happened over two or three trades and we spend the rest of the time losing or is it a smooth gain over time and that's something certainly that we're going to look at. Something else obviously that we need to look at as well is not just the US dollar Japanese yen but we should really run this over all the pairs that we ran in the moving average simulation. To do that inside a notebook would be a bit of a pain as you can probably guess so what we're going to do for the next steps is once we've looked at the cumulative gains very quickly just for this simulation is we're going to move on and take all the code that we've written here and build it into a script that can then run on its own and simulate everything at once for us. So having done a simple moving average cross simulator and now done something much more complicated with finer granularity prices, spreads, trigger points, take profits, stop losses and things like that, you've got quite a tool set I would say in your armory to be able to start building simulations of your own strategies and hopefully you're realizing actually that it's pretty essential to be able to do this because just going off the results of a couple of hundred recent trades or scrolling through a chart by hand of a few currency pairs, I guess you're now seeing just how misleading that can be and it's more or less random. You need some kind of good statistical basis to work on to be sure that your strategy is correct. So then, thanks very much for watching this one. I hope it made some sense. I really hope I haven't got any bad bugs in the code because I was a bit irritated to find the previous error that I did. But assuming everything's okay, then I'll see you in the next video. Thanks very much for watching.